So, hello, I'm um, Nicholas Lovell. Um, Jonathan, uh, John, not Jonathan, John uh, asked me to give a talk in 20 minutes. I normally talk for something between an hour and a day. So I'm gonna go really, really fast. So um, amongst other things, I run a website called Games Brief. I consult to a bunch of clients. I write books. You should follow my website. I'm not gonna keep going at this speed. Um, but what I want to do is introduce you to something which I think of as the fundamental core of free-to-play game success. The talk is going to cover both business and design. For the designers, um, not only is it useful for you, but it's useful for you to explain to your bosses why you're doing stuff. For your bosses, it's why you can go back to the designers and say, make your sessions shorter. That doesn't mean they have to be shorter, they have to be possible to be shorter. Um, and that's what I want to talk about through the next 15 minutes. So, um, I call it sessioning. And the starting point is you need to accept that players are going to stop playing your game. Not ever. Um, Rick just pointed out that people may well play your game for days, weeks, months and years. But every single day there's going to come a point where they're going to stop playing. We need to sleep and we need to eat. It's going to happen. Our job is to make it as easy as possible for them to come back as comfortable as possible for them to leave and to make damn sure that when they leave they come back again either later today or tomorrow. And that for me is the core building block of free to play success. Um, I'm not an artist, you can probably tell, um, but this is my drawing of this. You want players to start playing your game. You want them to have fun while they're there and there's a moment which I call, well there we are, the on-ramp, playtime and time to go, where you essentially say, it's okay guys, you can leave, I won't be upset. Go away, that's fine. Do come back, but it's okay to leave. So I want to break each of these down uh, through the next 13 minutes. So, does anybody know this game, Legend of Grimrock? Has anybody played it? You're not a core audience in here. So, okay, more hands going up. So, is anybody old enough to remember Dungeon Master on the Atari ST or the Amiga? More hands that time. So this is basically Dungeon Master, um, but prettier. Um, and it's a, a game on Steam that is quite core and it's got quite a spatial awareness puzzle built into it. it take, you've got to kind of put a weight over here and put a lever over here. Remember this clanking thing means something's moving over here and fight a monster. It can take some time to get yourself back into the flow of playing that game. Anybody recognise this game? Put your hands up if you recognise this one. You should recognise this in this room, Pocket Planes. Guys, you need to play more games. I know it's old, but even so. So, um, Pocket Plane's a very different game. It's a game where you basically move cargo and people around the world in planes, and it's a lot of fun. Um, a few years ago, uh, two or three years ago now, I was playing a lot of Grimrock on Steam. I put my kids to bed. I came downstairs. I sat down in the room where my Steam computer lives, and I thought, I haven't got time to play Legends of Grimrock. So I took out my iPad, and I started playing Pocket Planes, and two and a half hours later, I hadn't moved. It's not that I didn't have time to play this game. It's that this game required me to promise that I was going to sit down and take this game seriously. This game made it really easy for me to get into it, and then I carried on playing it for a very long time. The equivalent in ordinary life is you come home after a day at a conference, you get home, you turn on the telly, and you see 12 Years a Slave is on. And you go, well, I haven't got time to watch that. And you turn on Britain's Funniest Animals and you watch that for three hours. Because it is that you've got time. It's that the promise of committing to the game is a problem. And that's our biggest advantage against console titles. It's not that our games are better or worse or their games are better or worse. It's that when you sit down to play Tomb Raider, you're promising that you're going to spend at least half an hour with that game before you even turn it on. If you sit down to play Dark Souls, it's way more than that. If you sit down to play EVE Online, you're promising you're going to spend five hours with this game. It's not that this game can't draw you in. The myth that we need short sessions is a myth. Session lengths can be very long, but they need to have the promise of possibly being short simply in order to draw people into the game. The fact that you have to commit to a long session is a big barrier to entry. So for me, the on-ramp makes it easy to say, yes, I've got time to play this game. There's another thing to bear in mind, the competition on this, if you're in slots, the competition on this isn't other slots games. If you're in racing, it's not other racing games. For all of us, it's Facebook. You've always got time to go and check Facebook. And Facebook is just a game. How much do people like my post? How much is happening? What's happening in this world? Your on-ramp has to be better than Facebook's on-ramp 
to really compete. That's bloody hard. Our return hooks are better than theirs, but our on-ramp, it's very difficult to make it, uh, to make it as good as that. So the on-ramp leads to this question called, oops, called the Starbucks test. Is anybody familiar with this? So I first heard it from Torsten Ryle, who runs Natural Motion, which makes uh, My Horse and Clumsy Ninja. And is Titans out yet? I don't know. They've been promising it for a while. Um, have I got time to have a meaningful interaction with the game in the time it takes for my barista to make my macchiato? Because we're all a bit kind of hipster here. But um, it's, this is massively misunderstood, particularly in the core audience, because that doesn't mean the session has to be short it means that I can have a meaningful interaction quickly, which is a different question. So the other thing to say very quickly is this depends on the device. If you're making for mobile, your phone is here, here in your pocket. You can go from thinking about playing to playing very quickly. My iPad's in my bag. I want to sit down to play it. It might be a minute or so. Um, if it's on Facebook, you're already on Facebook, but you've got to fire up Unity or, or whatever it is in, in the game, um, it's longer. If you're trying to play games on Steam, particularly if you're like me and you don't play that often, you go in and Steam updates and it's slow and you've, you've frankly got time to make a, a cup of coffee while you're waiting for this. And um, OK, so I'm on PS3, not PS4, but bloody hell, if I want to start playing a console game, I've got 20 minutes between deciding I want to play and all the automatic updates actually having taken place. So the Starbucks test does vary by device. I don't think the phone and the tablet are the same device because the use cases are so different. So you can get away with a longer Starbucks test. How quickly can I get in and have a meaningful interaction on a tablet than you can on a phone? So who passes the test? Here are some games, some of them are quite old now, which do really well. These really early games, they're in Cocos 2D. I mean, they load quickly five or ten seconds between deciding to play and being able to collect some coins or make a decision. These games, much longer. Generally, they're either higher graphical quality or require online connectivity, so that slows down the Starbucks test. This game, two bloody minutes it takes me on my iPad mini to be able to play it. And halfway through, they stop and say, do you want to load this vault? And I go, I've only got one bloody vault. Of course I do. Why do you make it? So I have to stop in the middle. I have enough time while trying to load Fallout Shelter to load up Facebook on my phone to pass the time while I'm waiting for it to load. Now, obviously, Fallout Shelter <coughs> is a very successful game. So passing the Starbucks test is not an absolute must do. But, and if they didn't have that brand, that problem would literally have killed their game stone dead. So the Starbucks test is addressing two questions. Have I got time for this game right now, and will it be worth it for the effort I have to go through? When I do my master classes, I get in trouble for this slide, because they say, so we should do good things and not do bad things. Not necessarily. In free-to-play, there's no right or wrong. Everything is a trade-off between pros and cons. So good things. You load quickly. As soon as you get in, you say, well done, came back, have some gold. Um, it doesn't make you turn up and immediately go, everything you've done has turned to crap, you have to fix it. It makes you feel good for turning up. Animal Crossing breaks that rule, not that it's free to play, but it does say, look, your world is just rubbish. Um, it has one more go gameplay, so um, you get in very quickly, you can play Crossy Road and then have another a go. It passes the Starbucks test. Bad things, a splash screen. A splash screen with a pause on it, absolutely never. But a splash screen that's very flashly animated, unless it's covering up load times, then it's really good. But if it's slowing things down, it's a terrible thing. It's just your vanity. Stop it. Um, Unity. Unity's terrible for this. It's slow. Unity's awesome. You should probably be in Unity. But there's a trade-off. PvP and matchmaking. Hearthstone. If I want to sit down and play Hearthstone, I need to know I have 20 minutes available. I will choose to go to Facebook or into, uh, I'm not actually playing, I'm deeply obsessed by Hearthstone at the moment, but into one of those idle games, uh, uh, Farm Away or something like that. I can go into that, but I couldn't go into Hearthstone. Online connectivity. Supercell insists on it. Most successful free-to-play games company in the world, but it's bad for the on-ramp. Um, and complexity. Get me into your game quickly to do something of value. Have those layers added later, like I talked about with um, Pocket Planes. And there is no excuse to interrupt the loading, to ask me if I'm sure I want to play. That's just stupid, Bethesda. 
Um, and equally, as soon as I fold up my iPad, um, I'm not sure everybody has this use case because I play a lot of games. My kids are a little bit older now, but I play a lot of games where any moment I was likely to be interrupted with, I need a Wii. Um, and that means that any game where when I flip down the iPad and it collapses out, which Fallout Shelter does, I go, I'm not playing that game. I'm going to go and play Candy Crush Saga. When I suspend the game, I can jump straight back into where I was immediately. Now, all of these things, you know, Fallout Shelter did amazingly well and looked beautiful. But it came at a cost, a cost which you have to think whether it's worth it for the game that you are making. So that's what I just said. Um, here are some really good games with terrible on-ramps. So one set of trade-offs. Playtime, the bit in the middle. It should be fun, rewarding, satisfying, profitable. I could spend a whole day talking about that. So I'm going to assume you've made a bit of game in the middle that's fun. Now let's move on, because that's easy. Um, so, having made a bit of fun, you need to say to them, OK, I know you're going to leave. How am I going to make it easy for you to go, OK, I can go now. Not necessarily I have to. We did a lot of that with energy, and I will discuss that. But make it easy to say, it's time to go, come back later. So let me give you one example from Hearthstone. Who's playing Hearthstone? And who has played Hearthstone? So, okay, so most of us have this example. The most valuable thing in Hearthstone is cards, and the way to get cards is to get gold. That's kind of it. So every day, you get a chance to have a mission to win gold. It's the fastest way of winning gold. The next day, you'll get another mission. Now you've got two. The next day, you'll get a third mission. Now you've got three. And until you've cleared one of them, you can't get any more. So it's a sort of fear of missing out reason to keep playing. I've trained my seven-year-old very well. He was very worried yesterday that we hadn't cleared enough missions, so we went away and played a lot until he'd cleared some, which is bad because I've trained my seven-year-old to play Hearthstone, but I have quite a lot of parental pride that he wins all his matches, um, <laughs> albeit in casual. Um, so now I'm looking at this, and I'm slightly twitching that I haven't cleared at least one of them because tonight at 11 o'clock, because I'm a core player, so I know that's going to happen, a new mission would appear to give me gold if I've cleared one. And if I haven't, then I've lost that gold forever. So every day I might come back, every three days I definitely come back. But once I've cleared this, the game says, look, you can keep playing. It's not energy. It hasn't kicked me out. But it's told me that, you know what, if you're just min-maxing this, if you're just trying to be efficient for gold, you've done everything you need to do today, you can go now. Heyday does the same thing. You come into Heyday and you harvest your crops and you make your farm work and you set up your crops running. You can now spend hours pottering, redesigning your farm, doing all sorts of things. But you don't have to. If you just wanted to min-max or if you don't have very much time or if your macchiato is now ready, you can go, I go in, I grab that stuff, I left. Clearly you can't do Hearthstone while you're waiting for a macchiato unless they're very slow. Um, I'm going to jump in. John, I've got two minutes left. Am I allowed to overrun? How long? Five minutes more? Okay. So um, the energy, um, I'm going to keep negotiating this. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more. I'll leave you hanging. Say, so please let him finish. Um, it might be money there. Um, the energy, I'm against energy. Um, it's incredibly useful. I use it in a bunch of my uh, client-related games. But it has quite a lot of negatives. I even saw one client who had a system they called energy which wasn't an energy mechanic. So they had all of the bad stuff of using energy and being evil free to play without any of the benefits of it. Um, because I have to go fast, I'm going to give you some pros and cons. So good things about energy. You've finished the session. You've played CSR racing. You've used up 10 pips of fuel. It's time to bugger off or pay up. Um, that's a bit Zynga-esque and a bit not super cell -y and we're a bit more in the super cell era than the Zynga era, so be a bit cautious about that. As a designer, it allows us to control session lengths. Some people think this is us just being evil. You make it so it's fun, so you want to give us money. And sure, we do do some of that. But the other point is going, if I give you a chocolate cake and say, here's a chocolate cake, eat it, all of it, all of it. Whereas if you go, here's one slice, that's nice. Tomorrow I'll have another slice. The next day I'll have another slice. You actually like the cake more than if I make you eat it all in one day. That isn't us being evil by not letting you have the cake. You'll actually enjoy the cake more by it being parceled out. So there are cynical elements. We think our game isn't good enough to entertain you for an hour if we let you play it. So we only let you play 20 minutes so you don't notice how rubbish we are. Versus the, actually, if you have too much of anything in one go, it ceases to be fun. Energy is good for parceling that out, which is the next point. 
It can reduce player boredom and it can make choices matter more. So let's say you're at the end of a CSR racing session, you've got one pip of fuel left, you could just grind in a really dull match, you're certain to win, but you go, I'm going to stop after this. Maybe I'm going to push a bit earlier than I should for beating the boss because that will make me feel awesome. By making energy have a purpose, you're making the player choices in the game feel better and more important than simply grinding. So, and you can monetize energy and we can sell energy, but I, don't, I think these are the reasons which are more beneficial. But the downsides, it can be very clunky. Lots of people think energy is evil free to play. I do blame Zynga a lot for that. Um, it can prevent your biggest players from playing. I want to keep playing for four hours. Why won't you let me? And it's not generous. Some people think I'm weird about this, but I think free to play is a generous business model. We give a lot of stuff away for free in order to draw people in so they'll spend money on things they value. Putting a hard stop in front of it stops some of that relationship. And I believe there are better ways, although some of them are simply having an energy mechanic that is essentially hidden in plain, in plain sight. So let's figure out ways to hide it. One of the obvious ways of hiding it is something like in Heyday, when each farm plot is essentially a bit of energy. Once you've harvested your farm plot and replanted it, there's nothing more you can do in that time-gated mechanic. You can spend money to accelerate it. It behaves just like energy, but it doesn't have that energy thing at the top, which means it doesn't look like the sign of evil free to play. I'm going super fast now, but I also want to leave the idea of pottering. The old mod mod model was play, run out of energy, now pay up or piss off. And it's so hard to keep people in games now that the idea of kicking somebody else out ever is a big, a big challenge. But we don't want them to progress so fast through the game that our content treadmill becomes crazy. What we want to do is let them spend time just pottering around. If you're playing in Hearthstone, you can spend a lot of time just building decks and not actually playing them. If you're playing in pretty well any farming or city builder, you can make your place look prettier. You can start planning out what it is that your next upgrade is going to be, what your next catch of fusion is going to be. But the idea is that for the min-maxers, we've said, come in, complete your task, leave. And for the other people who go, oh, I'm in, I'm quite enjoying it, Clash of Clans, it's often chat. You're spending time chatting with your other clan mates. That's another form of pottering. It's a very UK-centric word. It's not even an English word, pottering. Basically means middle-aged man goes down to his shed and pretends to do DIY or plant plots while actually just having a cup of tea to get away from his family. That's what pottering really means. And there's a huge value of that in free-to-play games because for most people, free-to-play is an escape from their daily life. So let them just stay there if they're having fun. So Heyday does it. Fallout Shelter does quite a lot of it. You can go in, you can quickly set all of your things going, and then you're trying to turn your women into breeding machines, which is a bit weird. Um, but that's what the game is broadly about. It's, yeah, it has some challenges with its concept of women, but never mind. Um, and Hearthstone has it too. So in two minutes, two minutes, I'm going to run through a bunch of different return hooks. How do you get people to come back to the game? Just be fun. You're all trying to do this, but this is lightning in a bottle. I don't think that you should say, I'm going to make my game fun and that's enough. You should be saying, I'm going to make my game as awesomely fun as this one, it's Crossy Road. But if I fail, let's make sure we've got some contingency plans to still keep people coming back. Let's have appointment mechanics. If somebody plants pumpkins, um, I'm going to be deeply stereotypical now, American soccer mum gets up in the morning, it's seven o'clock, she goes, I've got to take the kids to school, do the laundry, do the grocery shopping, but I've got some me time now. I'm not going to have any more me time until three o'clock, just before the kids come home. So I'm playing Farmville, what am I going to do? I'm going to plant some pumpkins, which will be ready in eight hours. And her own personal to-do list has just changed, to take the kids to school, do the laundry, do the grocery shopping, and harvest some pumpkins. You don't need to send a needy local notification saying, please come back, I'm your annoying boyfriend who keeps begging. She's going to come back of her own accord because she promised the game that she'd collect those pumpkins at three o'clock. She will feel bad if she doesn't keep her promise. And that's why you can, I don't think you should, but you can wither the crops because she made a promise. It's going to leave you with a thought that it's not a Tamagotchi. I'll leave the designers amongst you to work out why this is different to Tamagotchi, not an appointment mechanic. Um, or come and hire me as a consultant or something. Um, social mechanics. Um, 
I logged in to Candy Crush every day for several weeks after I'd stopped playing because lots of my friends had given me tickets to open next levels and I felt guilty that I wasn't responding by give, giving them tickets back. I wasn't playing anymore, so I went in every day to give them the tickets back. Of course, I said I wasn't playing, but then I was in the game and it was there, so I just pressed play because it was fun. That's an example of an on-ramp. The social pressure to draw me back in pulled me back in and then I was in. I wasn't in Facebook, I was in Candy Crush. So Candy Crush could then get me with its fun playtime. If you don't log in regularly in Clash of Clans, your mates will hate you and eventually they'll kick you out. So you have to go back in. If your friends are raiding in Warcraft and you're the healer, you know, you need to be there. So social pressures are very powerful. Competition is very powerful. Um, get back in to get to the top, to be legend or to beat other people. Um, if you don't come back, bad things will have happened. I know I said earlier, don't make me tidy your room. Um, that's because it's a bad on-ramp, but it's quite a strong return hook. You just have to think about the balance for your individual game. Have events. I'm anti-events because if you have a game which relies on events to work, it means the fundamental game isn't fun enough and you're using a plaster or an elastoplast or a band-aid to fix it. I love events because they really work. Don't build them into your soft launch. Test if your game is fun without events and then add them later. And if you're going to do events, for God's sake, don't do Halloween. I had one client who had an Easter promotion, which they launched the day after Easter because their schedule slipped. And they didn't have enough money to wait for a year for it to happen. Your schedule will slip. So make events which are not quite as time sensitive as Easter or um, Halloween or even Christmas. Try and make events which will work even if your schedule slips by six months. Eventually, you'll need this stuff, but that's mature stuff. Or have a daily login bonus. Well done. You came back. I love you. But don't put that in your soft launch either. We know it works. It drives retention, but it's a band-aid. You can add it during your soft launch. It's not a gating item for getting to soft launch. And finally, be a needy boyfriend. But nobody likes needy boyfriends. So if your retention strategy is we will do a local notification, your game sucks. It needs to be that people go, oh, thank you very much for reminding me. I'm really grateful. And then this stuff works. But if this is just the heart of it, you're stuffed. So this is the session. They came. Hey, I've got time to play this. They had fun. They went, it's OK. The game doesn't mind if I leave now. Oh, I need to come back a bit later, though. And the cycle starts again. That's the heart of the player session. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not let you have any questions. Sorry? I've had one too late. No, fine. I was going to say, I could be cruel and not let him have any questions, but I think uh, we will let, allow at least one question. Then we'll have a question for Nicholas. Well, they might have any. I went very fast. You haven't fast. got any. You've covered it all. I have to say, I used to say um, for push notifications, I had never seen a good push notification until I started playing Farm Away. So Farm Away yep. has very good push notifications, it's ones that make you laugh out loud. And you're actually grateful yes. that they turned up. Exactly. And I think that makes a big difference. Good. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Okay, thank you very much.